Welcome to the session on mapping ocean finance for a new decade, sustainable blue economy finance. My name is Dennis Fitch, and I lead the sustainable blue economy work stream at UNFFI. Today, we want to speak about the ocean and why its health is crucial for financial institutions and society. We have a set of brilliant speakers for you to discuss this topic, who I want to welcome warmly to today's panel. Speaking about their work as it relates to the sustainable blue economy today are Lucy Holmes, Senior Project Program Manager of Seafood Finance at WWF, Dr. Melissa Walsh, Program Manager for the Ocean Finance Initiative at the Asian Development Bank, Francis Chen, Senior Manager at China Industrial Bank at Mitsuno Inada from Tokyo Marine Holdings. To briefly set the scene, the ocean is the largest ecosystem on Earth. It covers over 70% of our planet and is home to 80% of all life. But not only that, the ocean regulates the global climate, acts as the largest natural carbon sink and produces around half the oxygen we breathe. Seafood and other marine organisms provide a primary source of protein for almost 3 billion people, and coral reefs and mangrove forests act as natural barriers protecting coastal communities from storms and floods. All these goods, services and economic activities we derive from the ocean are estimated to be equivalent to the world's seventh largest economy in GDP terms. And this global economic output is reliant on a healthy ocean. Unfortunately, human activities have already severely altered two thirds of the marine environment, leading to a triple crisis concerning the climate, biodiversity and nature loss, as well as pollution and waste. In addition to being serious threats to nature and society, these crises also lead to economic losses, which are often not considered. These topics are very relevant right now for the activities of banks, insurers and investors. One just has to look at the front pages of news outlets globally over the last few months. Be it an oil spill off the pristine coast of Mauritius, a large scale explosion in a board in Beirut, or a public outcry over illegal fishing fleets. Mismanaged marine industries and economic activities with a negative impact on the ocean are receiving ever more coverage and climb up the agenda of governments, financial institutions, and society as a whole. It becomes clear that business as usual is no longer an option. The sustainable blue economy acts as a vision for any ocean linked sector. There are traditional ocean-linked industries which are not very sustainable in their current state and which need financing to transition wherever possible. There are others which are already on the right track, however, they require support to scale sustainable business models. But this is not only an environmental challenge, it is also an economic opportunity. And by building sustainable blue finance practices into their decision-making processes, and by engaging with their clients on these issues, financial institutions have a unique opportunity to steer ocean industries towards sustainability. Building resilience and long-term stability into marine industries means that financial players reduce risks of default and claims, ensuring their financial activities provide long-term viability and profitability. This is why the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative at UNFFI is working with banks, insurers, and investors to mainstream sustainable finance practices supporting ocean health across the global finance industry. Crucially, we support the implementation of the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles, which aim to direct the flow of capital towards activities which directly contribute to SDG 14 life below water. They are the world's first global guiding framework to finance the sustainable blue economy and crucially are aligned with ex existing principles and frameworks, such as the PRB, PRI and PSI, putting them into practice in an ocean context. Building on the momentum of these principles, and together with our more than 60 members, we have just released a first of its kind practical toolkit to consider finance for the sustainable blue economy. It helps financial decision makers discover how to avoid and mitigate environmental and social risks and impacts, as well as how to make the most of opportunities across five key ocean linked sectors. This guidance provides a detailed breakdown of which activities to seek out as best practices which client activities to challenge, and which activities to avoid financing completely due to their damaging nature. For more information, you can find the link to download the guidance below the screen. Let's move on to the panel discussion. I'm happy to have such a level of expertise from the environmental as well as the financial angle today. Could I start with you, Lucy, and ask, why is this topic important for financial institutions to take into account? Thanks, Dennis. Um... Yeah, it's a really important question. And of course, you've you've touched on a lot of those key points um, in your introduction. But I think it's fair to say that um, 
reversing the decline of ocean health and, and recovering our ocean assets and natural capital is one of the most pressing challenges of our time. Um, you know, the ocean is, is quite simply vital to um, humanity and, and to the societies that depend on it um, and the businesses that depend on it, as well as the financial institutions who are invested in those businesses. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's equivalent to <coughs> the seventh largest economy in the world. And just to add to that, it, it, it um, is worth around 24 trillion dollars in total assets and estimated from a WWF report in 2015, um, producing benefits of around two and a half trillion dollars every year. So economically speaking, it's, it's absolutely vital, um, as well as its, its uh, co-benefits, um, regulating climate, pretty big one, um, feeding the world's populations, um, producing half the oxygen we breathe, for example, and supporting many millions, if not billions of livelihoods all around the world. In the Coral Triangle, which is in Asia, where, we're, um, where we are today, virtually, speaking, um, the ocean is, is fundamental and the blue natural capital that, that supports the economies of many of many of the Southeast Asian nations, for example, um, is, is really important. And, you know, to give you a few examples of that, I think 76% of the world's corals reside in the Coral Triangle, for example, and 37% of the reef, global reef fish species are in the Coral Triangle. Six out of the seven um, turtle species are based in the Coral Triangle, and many more statistics like that. You know, um, very importantly, linking that to, to people, 130 million people approximately depend on the health and the biodiversity and the benefits, ecosystem services that result from that in the, in the Asia region. So essentially, Dennis, all of that is fundamental to to our economies and our um, our health, but unfortunately, um, all the indicators are trending in in the wrong direction. Um, recent reports um, point to decline in a number of areas. For example, um, we've already lost half the world's coral reefs. For example, um, and the implications for that, in terms of food security and livelihoods, are, are quite quite stark. Fish stocks are in decline, and nearly two thirds are either fish at their maximum or over their maximum limit, for example. So the importance uh, for investors is that these are material risks um, to the businesses that they support and that they finance. Um, without coming up with ways to reverse those trends, um, you know, and, and financial institutions have a vital role to play in that, to support through engagement um, with companies, for example, through understanding the risks that they potentially face, through setting expectations, for example, they are really able to support that transition. Um, and, you know, I think it's, we can't state clearly enough how, how important that is, not just from a um, environmental and social imperative, but really from a financial one as well. Thanks very much, Lucy, for, for laying that out so, so neatly. Um, I'd like to move on to, to Melissa and ask a, a similar question that, that kind of leads on from that. And Lucy talked about risks and, and materiality, but uh, for Asian Development Bank, what, what is the business case for a sustainable blue economy for your organization? Thanks, Dennis, um, and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's such an important topic. Um, to answer your question, I might start a little bit with the big picture and then drill down. Globally, we know that investing two to four trillion across sustainable ocean sectors will generate a net benefit of eight to 23 trillion in the next 30 years. Um, and for the Asia Pacific region, blue economy sectors such as tourism, fisheries, aquaculture, they're major contributors to the region's economy. But these sectors, um, as, as the previous speaker Lucy has mentioned as well, they're at risk due to unsustainable practices. This year, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report 
um, identified biodiversity loss and human environmental damage as two of the biggest risks to the global economy. And for example, in fishing, the cost of overfishing has reduced the net benefit of global fisheries by 83 billion. Two thirds of that loss is in Asia. So if we don't invest in businesses that sustain the ocean, we're putting the entire economy at risk. The, the second reason, I guess, the business case for the ADB is that supporting the blue economy is about getting ahead of this tidal wave of market pressure that's coming. At ADB, we are in, under increasing pressure from our investors, clients, and partners to disclose climate and nature-related risks. Credit agencies are mainstreaming sustainability assessments. There's global accounting standards that are being updated to ensure inclusion of sustainability risks. And there's international agreements being forged to remove harmful subsidies. And frankly, change is coming. And as financial institutions, we need to get ahead of the curve to better understand and mitigate nature-related risks. Third, the financial sector is seeing this unprecedented demand for sustainable investments, particularly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the global green economy is worth $8 trillion, but the new frontier is the blue economy, and it too is booming. ADB is surveying emerging blue economy segments, and we're finding many new investment opportunities. Take clean energy, for example. The terrestrial green energy market is expanding, but it's limited by available land. The oceans, however, can provide almost limitless supplies of renewable energy. Offshore wind alone could generate 23 times more power than present total global electricity consumption. And there's numerous examples of emerging tech investments. ADB is working with the European Space Agency to deliver high tech fisheries enforcement products for the island nation of Kiribati. But lastly, for the ADB, investing in the blue economy is not about, it's not just about these shiny new investments, but the blue economy is ADB core business. ADB is committed to sustainable development and eradicating extreme poverty. And supporting ocean health is fundamental to achieving those objectives. Many traditional sectors for ADB, such as sanitation, wastewater, flood risk management, these sectors have massive benefits for ocean health and sustainable livelihoods. And for these more traditional segments, you know, what we're finding is that nature-based solutions are the cost-effective investment choice. So, for example, coastal ecosystems provide protection from waves and storms. But the kicker is this. Restoring coastal ecosystems is two to five times cheaper than engineering solutions. So, because this business case for sustainable blue economies is so strong and healthy oceans are so critical to the prosperity of our region, in 2019, ADB launched our action plan for healthy oceans and sustainable blue economies. And we're committed to scale up blue economy investments to 5 billion by 2024. And we're actively seeking partners to help us to meet this ambitious target. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Certainly a lot of arguments for getting involved in, in, in this topic, in this field. Um, Francis, is that similar uh, for China Industrial Bank? What is your what is your business case for the sustainable blue economy and to be involved in this in this area? Okay. Okay, thanks, Dennis. So uh, our case comparing to like uh, more policy banks like ADB or like NGOs such as WF is kind of like, um, I could say kind of different because uh, we're more of like, more of like a pop from uh, private sector. So uh, for for us, the uh, sustainable business economy, we can, I say I would say I can probably talk about it. Um, I could divide it into two sectors. One is about the new business opportunity, and another one is basically how to uh, manage how to uh, manage manage the uh, I can say environmental climate risk with the with the guidelines which uh, with the UNP just provided. So I so I talk about the uh, business opportunities because we know the ocean the ocean economy is kind of, is kind of like a new area. It's, it, the ocean is blue, and it, it is actually a blue market. For example, I'll take probably the Chinese offshore like wind, wind power, wind power sector, for example, because uh, if I remember correctly, like 50% of the population are concentrated 
uh, around the area which is which is uh, close to the coastline no longer for no longer about like 200 kilometers. So this is where 50 of the population is concentrated. This is where most of the industri industries, factories, and also the electricity usage, your like usage from. However, the uh, the land wind power is kind of like limited because of the overpopulation and because of so many reasons. The wind power in for in the of the uh, land land wind power in China mostly concentrated in the west area where basically is there's the no man's land. So it's very hard to transfer the electricity power from there. So what we can do is just we look to the sea because actually the the Chinese the wind power coastline in Chinese in China Sea is very it's very rich very rich actually comparing to some other other wind farms in, in the rest of the world. However, because of the technology issue and because of the cost issue, this sector is I would say very underdeveloped. So, so we see this. This is actually a very, this is like a blue market. This is like a blue water market. So, so to focus on the ocean economy is a way actually to find new business opportunities. And the second one is about the risk man risk management because we're all familiar with the climate risk, their physical risk, their transition risk. But I'll provide you with a more solid example because, um, in in a, in the city of China, Shenzhen, for if for someone if you know. Uh, the legislators there just passed a law which officially makes the makes lenders liability a legal liability because if they they should be they should be held accountable for the pro, for the projects they lend money they lend money to if the projects do any damage to the environment. This is this is so far I know the first time that China officially make a law about that. So for financial institutions, it's always a good way to think ahead of it. We we should not just wait till there's something something bad happen something bad happen where where there's a fine comes out until we realize there's a, there's such a risk. So this is actually from the financial part. Another part is from the reputational one because now nowadays with the internet with the internet one everyone knows if you finance like to finance like a project which damage to the wetland everybody will know and this is a serious reputational risk. So um, this is very brief. An answer to probably to this question, and if you have more time, I can talk about the case in more detail. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks very much, Francis. I'm, I'm very happy that you that you mentioned uh, offshore wind as a particular sector. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's that's one of the topics that we covered in the the blue finance guidance that that I mentioned during my introduction. Um, so actually, that leads me back to Lucy, who was uh, directly involved in develop in the development of this guidance and. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what this guidance is and, and how um, financial institutions can practically use it? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Dennis, for the opportunity. Um, and I think you know all the speakers thus far have touched on the importance of both the risks and the opportunities um, of the of the blue economy and the transition to the sustainable blue economy, um, and the importance of understanding the risks that actually are being faced at economy wide level but also um sector level and you know then down to business activity level and that that really actually um is a great segue into the guidance and, and the rationale for UNEPFI and, and WF supporting that process to develop this guidance um the idea was really to provide practical sector specific information for banks investors and insurers as well as other types of financial institutions and indeed beyond that to other type stakeholder groups as well. Um, it covers five blue economy sectors that we know are um, heavily dependent on or have an impact on the ocean um, and that have a, um, uh, in, in some cases, very clear transition pathway. Um, those sectors are, as Dennis mentioned, um, marine renewable energy. Um, marine um, and coastal tourism, the seafood sector, both wild capture and aquaculture is in, in one, as it were, um, and shipping and port development. So those are the sort of uh, the key areas that it covers. Um, and really the idea is to take the principles, uh, the sustainable blue economy finance principles, 
and um, understand or support uh, rather financial institutions to understand how that they can practically use those at implementation level. Um, and we know that this is important because actually at the beginning of the process, um, working with UNIPFI, the, um, there was a survey done to which over 80 financial institutions responded, really indicating that there is a quite broad and surging interest in understanding how to match capital with, um, with ocean health, which was really um, you know, very encouraging to hear. But at the same time, hearing that really the financial sector is at the very beginning of that journey um, of really understanding what that means. So the guidance felt very timely. And just to give you a little understanding, and you know, of course, Dennis mentioned you can download it. Um, it is essentially uh, uh, two components to it. So there's a, re a report, if you like, a narrative component, which is a, um, a sector by sector analysis of um, the really the impacts um, from each from each sector, really explaining clearly and concisely how specific activities have the potential to contribute to environmental and social impacts, and then why those impacts, not only detrimental to the environment and to society, but also to the businesses that depend on them. Um, and then the second component is um, a downloadable um, appendix, which is um, the actual guidance where it goes very much into detail about what the mitigation um, strategies are that um, businesses can take in order to uh, minimize or, or mitigate those risks and maximize opportunities. So there are three categories that, um, that, that uh, are flagged within this, which Dennis mentioned, um, and I'll just reiterate. So the, the, um, the traffic light system, if you like, per per sector and per activity within each sector is really to reflect the the um, the action that financial institutions can take as a result of understanding whether or not um, a particular risk is is in place. Um, and the avoid category, the red category is for the most serious risks where the recommendation is really to avoid financing or do not finance activities that have uh, those risks associated with them such as illegality, for example. Um, and then the, at the other end of the spectrum, there is the seek out category, which is really the opportunity side. So what types of core business line, core business activities and business models should we be looking for as a really good investment that not only is future-proofed with respect to um, risk management, but also understanding where each sector is going and, and what is required to actually solve some of these problems. And in the middle, which is um, the, the, the broadest category really is what we've called challenge. And that's really to, to support financial institutions to understand how they should be engaging clients and or portfolio companies, um, for example, to set out expectations of um, how they would like businesses to manage certain risks and what types of tools and resources should they be implementing? Um, and then finally, the, the report also outlines um, some case studies of, of where these, um, these types of uh, um, decisions have, have been made within financial decision making where these, these types of ESG um, requirements have already been integrated, just to sort of give a flavor of how that might work. And I think the things that we that we see as being the guidance being very useful for with respect to financial institutions, <clears throat> maybe three key things, um, but there are potentially others. Uh, there will be others. The first is really to sort of boost due diligence. So to, to support the existing um, information there is ESG analysis around some of these sectors and businesses. Um, we all know they, they don't necessarily go into as much detail as they could, and, and the ocean is rather an um, unexplored um, area in, in, the, in the ESG analysis world at the moment. So just trying to really boost that information for the financial sector. Secondly is really engagement and understanding how to, how to have conversations with clients and with, with companies. And then the third is, is product development, how to really create 
um, thematic bonds or funds, um, sustainability linked loans, for example, with credible um, KPIs that are able to reflect you know, the best available science. So I'll stop there. I think, um, yeah, if there are any additional points on that respect, then, then other panelists can maybe come back to those. Thanks very much, Lucy. And of course, we are very lucky today to have um, two experts from, from the field, so to speak, with us today. So, um, Melissa, how is ADB implementing the sustainable blue economy finance principles and also using the guidance to help in that? Um, yeah, thanks, Dennis. ADB is really proud to be a signatory of the principles and we're really taking them to heart and, and working hard to systematically integrate the principles into our investment decisions. Uh, the, the guidance that Lucy was just talking about um, has been quite recently introduced um, and previous to that we we've been working on the overarching 14 principles and how to apply those so I might speak a little bit about what we've been doing in that area first the, the first and second principles are about being protective of marine ecosystems and compliant uh, with international frameworks and ADB has a really strong safeguard system which screens out does negative screening on projects which could harm the environment and we also um, ensure that all ADB investments align with the joint MDB framework on climate finance. So all investments are climate aware and supportive of the transition to renewable energy. Another one that's really important to ADB is number five on inclusivity. We're partnering really closely with developing member countries and many island and coastal communities to ensure that all of our blue economy investments are supportive of vulnerable communities and particularly providing jobs and economic empowerment for women. Principles 11 and 12 are about making diversified and solution-driven investments. And ADB has three flagship ocean programs, which I think really articulate this. The first is around coastal resilience and nature-based solutions, where we're working directly with vulnerable coastal communities to use integrated gray green solutions. Our second flagship is focused on reducing marine plastic pollution. And this is both through integrated solid waste management, but also innovative circular economy approaches by both SMEs and global firms. And our third flagship is on ocean finance and the blue economy, in which we're seeking out innovative finance mechanisms, structures, and investments to scale up blue economies in the region. But the last principle that I really want to highlight is number seven on transparency. So this is really important to us. And in order to be fully transparent about ADB's blue economy investments, we're really pleased to share that we've created an ocean finance framework. The ADB ocean finance framework, it aligns with the sustainable blue economy finance principles, but it provides a more granular level of detail to the types of projects that ADB will fund and those that we will account towards our $5 billion commitment. It defines a typology of ocean investments and provides eligibility criteria for each type of an investment. We believe we're the first bank to explicitly create such a framework. And what we've learned through this process is that there's many economic segments which benefit the ocean and we need science-based and pragmatic thresholds to define what is and what's not a blue economy investment. And we're also building on this framework to develop a new green and blue bond framework, paving the way for the issuance of blue bonds, the first of which is expected in the third quarter of 2021 uh, with an issuance of up to 500 million. So our next step will be piloting the guidance, um, the recently released guidance, and we're really looking forward to working closely with other financial institutions to test if and how these guidelines can be applied in our investment decision-making processes and how they might interact with our ocean finance framework. Thanks. That's very exciting to hear, Melissa. Uh, thanks for highlighting that. And of course, we, we are now in the phase of really wanting to field test the guidance recommendations uh, across financial institutions. And um, Francis, you uh, at China Industrial Bank, you're one of the first um, organizations from China to, to join the initiative at Unibify. And uh, may I ask uh, why you joined and also how your 
uh, how the guidance that was just published might help you implement the principles. Hey, um, thanks, Dennis. So uh, I, I would say I would say, say probably the reasons for us uh, to join in the initiative is like because of two reasons. First one is about I, I would believe it's it uh, provides like a common ground or topics for 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 for, uh, for people to communicate or for people to compare between different projects because because uh, actually I can I can tell you right now we are actually developing um, we would say in house ESG ESG standards for our group so uh, one one thing one thing we find it really hard is to be to uh, to make details about the factors that we should focus on different sectors or uh, different industries, because for different industry, you need you will definitely different KPI KPIs to measure them. And actually, for uh, for blue economy, this uh, the KPI around this sector, I would say, is sometimes underdeveloped or require more develop compared to some other more more popular industries. So by joining by by just signing this, uh, we find we find the guidelines is really really helpful to uh for us, for us to, to start with to figure out which which factors which factors we should start with so that everybody can stay on the, can stay on the same page stay on the same page so for so the so the case that when 100 people comes out with 100 different standards for that that will that to make sure that won't happen and also for another one is because another reason is because we find it useful to use it inter to use it internally uh, this really related to our business strategy because uh, one of one of our key business strategies for us is to uh, focus on the bankable infrastructures in China. So because uh, for instance, for instance, because uh, like I would say, 20 years before, uh, half of the Chinese major cities they don't just lake up the enough capacity to trade the uh, to trade the urban wastewater. So the, uh, the wastewater will just be a uh, pop. Be pump out directly into rivers or seas, causing pollu causing pollution pollution and all, all sort of other, other problems. So that's some that's the, the these infrastructures are what China China is, has been needed for I would say in the past twenty years. So that has been always our business, key business strategy. So uh, when I say bankable, I mean I mean I mean the infrastructure that has its own cash flow or or with some Reasonable subsidies they can run on run on themselves. So water related infrastructure is actually is really fit, fit in this topic because like wastewater treatment facilities they could charge the users and they charge the users probably they, that will comes up like seventy percent of their income with the rest of the thirty percent of the income from government in, in government subsidies it will work perfectly. So these business has been always been our key like key asset. So we need to understand uh, for the past 20 years, we have been finding so many projects. What have they really done to the environment, to the society, to the environment, to the economy? So the, the guidelines are actually providing us a way to help us to, under, to help us to better understand our portfolio in both in terms of business strategy and in terms of the risk management. Ma risk management. So I will take a, take an example because like last year we issued the uh, I, I saw the first blue bond issued by uh, private sector. So that blue blue bond consists of, I would say, I remember, is 13 projects. I say two from the offshore, off the offshore wind power, and the rest they're all from the water infra infrastructures, either to either pipeline, either pipelines, or the wastewater treatment facilities around just close to the Chinese Chinese coastline. So the guidelines provide really provides a way for us to better take better look at in, in better look into these projects. And also provide a way for us to communicate with our investors. Say, you you you, you invest in our blue bond. So, what this project has done to the environment. So the investors have a better better idea about that. Yeah, that's certainly true. Thanks for highlighting that. May I ask you a follow-on question as well? Of course, we all know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have all experienced the blue economy really raising up the agenda and, and there being more and more interest from financial institutions in this topic, but it's certainly not mainstream yet. So what do you think are the current barriers for, for you know, your peers to, to enter or take the first steps in this, in this area? Um, I would say some barriers probably because of still a lack of like like lack of the like industrial standards or issues like that. I'll take 
probably the uh, the aquaculture or fishery, for example, because um, so far, I, so far as I know, in China, the fishery industry they still have they still don't have like I was sort of like uh, laboring labor or something to label it labor for like is sustainable fishery or saying something like that. There there is indeed like like there will be um, green food, some for example, but that's for the consumers. You can that's for the consumer to understand these these food the the processing the processing process. Uh, they don't use antibiotic, etc. However, what these what these um, industry has done to the to the environment is still a uh, lack of lack of regulatory reg, regulatory or law law enforcement. So uh, for kind of consumers, they really don't have like uh, they don't have a way to understand how the how the environmental impacts of these of these their, of these these products are. And for us, like financial institutions. We definitely don't have the expertise or or the time or or the time to look at each project to look at each each fish 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 farms and say what's how they're performing well. So these these uh, laboring or I would say, um, and what 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 we can expect the most ideal one is uh, more international recognized laboring. However, that still don't exist yet because. The, because the economic development all, and also the environmental standards in different countries that still remains different, so that's one barrier I will I will definitely has to has to come up with, come up with, and probably the, probably a second bar, second barrier is basically um, how to connect the environmental benefits with the uh, with the economic benefits, so. Um, one way to, to connect each other is through is through the uh, risk management risk management process because the uh, financial for us for us if for us we would we would try to understand if we if we invest in like for, for example the uh, the uh, residential mortgage in the coastline what will be what will be the uh, risk is that that house is being flooded or being hit by a typhoon so, now, however. The risk management is still indirectly related to the uh, private sector's profitability. So, so you you understand the risk, but you still don't understand. I I have been asked by lots of investors like I invest in your green bond. What's what's going to be my economic benefit from it? So we we so we need to educate them for educate them not not only from the from the investment return prop. The return of the investment, but but say hey we hey our green bond does reduce the risk of your risk of your investment. But however, if you ask me, what what would be the what would be the does it have a higher coupon rate? Um, probably there's there because there's different studies about that, but people still don't have have different opinions. So I would say this is a this is another barrier is not is not only exists in the blue economy environment. In economy, but also in the entire sustainable economy part. Yeah. Thanks very much, Francis. Yeah, I certainly agree. Education and regulation are two are two big ones, I think. Melissa, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, thanks. I'd absolutely echo Francis. You know, we're we're finding several challenges around this idea of definitions and thresholds. And now we've got some new guidance in five sectors, but for example, land-based pollution, we're struggling with it. We understand the science. We know that we need to work upstream in rivers in order to protect ocean ecosystems, but how far upstream and under what you know conditions would we consider a project to be blue? So there's still a lot of work to be done in that space. And this lack of universal indicators, you know, it's really challenging. And climate finance, it's easy to measure and report across institutions. You, you can look at tons of carbon. We have nothing like that in the blue economy. So being able to have standardized reporting and, um, at, you know, as Francis was saying, being able to clearly and simply articulate to investors what they're buying and, and the impact that we're creating, it's really difficult at this stage. Um, but one more quick challenge I'd bring up, we're still seeing a big mismatch between available capital and available project pipelines. And I, I think MDBs have a big role to play in this, you know, to de-risk projects and bring in the private sector and, and catalyze, um, but we've got a long way to go 
in, in order to match up the projects that are coming to us as a bank and, and the, the type of the type of capital that we have available with where we want to go in, in really driving forward the blue economy. Thanks very much, Melissa. I think that leads leads us perfectly to um, a close, unfortunately, of the session. Um, I would like to ask each of you to give a very brief final message um, and to make it a bit hopeful. I would like to ask you if you had one wish, what would you like your peers or, or governments um, to do in order to advance the sustainable economy? Maybe we can ask with Lucy, then Melissa, and then Francis. Over to you, Lucy. Thanks, Dennis, and I, I think all the points that the um, the other panelists just made are, are really critical takeaways in and of themselves. But um, I think my my wish, um, and and I, I think it's it is coming together, is is for financial institutions to really start acting in their own self self in light and self interest in in the context of setting expectations um, at a, a higher level than than we've seen in the past with respect to um ocean dependent sectors and, and the blue economy um really starting to articulate working with peers working with government well, advocating to governments let's say but working with the science community the ngo community to really start to um concretely set um the bar and expectations around specific aspects of sectors as to what they will or won't finance um and what they expect the uh, transition pathway to be if they do go ahead with financing. So I think that we are seeing that start to happen, but that would be my, um, yeah, my desire would be to, to start accelerating that work. Thanks very much, Lucy. Melissa, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I, I like the optimistic end to the, the, the panel. It's good. I think my wish is that all financial institutions would really take stock of how their investments are impacting the ocean for good and bad, and that we need to get past this idea of these niche and small investments for the ocean, but really look at all of our traditional sectors and how they're impacting the ocean and how we can um, improve those investments. And there are economically viable solutions to make our pipelines more blue. So, you know, and then after looking inward and understanding better what the impacts are and how we can make things more blue, then then going back outward and working together collectively um, as a community of financial institutions to build that market and, and, and grow it together, um, because we need to to ensure that we've got healthy and resilient oceans for the future. Thanks very much, Melissa. Francis, your last words, you have one, one minute left. Um, probably, I'll probably I'll say the one of the last one of the most wishes I have is for regu for financial regulators. Probably they can think about providing some more incentive policies to uh, the blue economy and also to the entire system of finance, system of finance as well. Because uh, just just take the uh, capital adequacy ratio or this ratio, for example, even just have. 10 basic points of preference towards the uh, more sustainable financing could unleash like I would say trillions of dollars into the whole world economy. So, th so that's actually a, a really power, powerful weapon for the for the for the regulators and provide incentives for, for, for providing incentives so so that we we don't we no longer works on just classify what we have done, but we have more incentives to to put more resources into the sustainable finance from we will say, we will say tradition, traditional brown asset. Super, thanks. And I love these uh, very positive calls to action at the end. With that, I, I really would like to thank our speakers and, to, and anyone tuning in today. I do want to finish by highlighting that financial institutions can act as an enabler of change by using their expertise in finding opportunities and understanding of risk. We, we do have a symbiotic relationship with the ocean and to solve the climate, biodiversity and pollution crises, a healthy and prosperous ocean is our main ally. So um, echoing our uh, excellent panelists today, I encourage any financial institutions in the audience today to evaluate their impact on the marine environment and to urgently show leadership on this topic of the sustainable blue economy. If you do want to learn more, um, join the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Initiative and don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks very much.